Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Margaret Walton Roberts on international migration. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the uh, Balsillie School's CG Chair of Global Security and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week I'm joined here in the studios of the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario by a noted expert in some field of global governance. And today I'm very pleased to welcome Margaret Walton Roberts, who's Thank Professor you. of Geography at Wilfrid Laurier University and also Director of the International Migration Research Center. Mm -hmm. And I hope this will be the first of a series of conversations with you and your colleagues on international migration, which is an issue I think that everyone acknowledges is increasingly important in the world, but one in which perhaps uh, global governance has a long way to go to catch up with the nature of the growing problem. Mm -hmm. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to start by asking you a little bit about the history of your center, the history in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the idea behind the International Migration Research uh, Center and where did it come from and how do you see it mm -hmm. progressing? The, the idea for the centre began in 2007, thereabouts. Um, I'm a geographer, a human geographer, and I've had an experience of being trained in a number of geography departments that have had a number of professors who work in the area. But when I came to Laurier, there weren't any geographers in my department who had a similar interest, but there were other members from different faculties and different departments. And so I thought to myself, how do I get all of these individuals together to create some kind of synergy around the topic of migration and migration research? And as a result of that, in collaboration and discussion with uh, a colleague, Jenna Hennebury, who was in the Department of, Social, of, of Sociology and Communications at that time, we decided to create a research centre. So we developed a research centre, a university level research centre in 2008, really as a platform for collaboration, debate and for research. And the, the centre was launched in 2008 and we've been quite successful since then. Mm. And are there many such centres around the world or is this a fairly unusual No, endeavor? there are, there are um, a number of centres globally. There are different um, research groups that have focuses that change slightly. So some would look at diaspora, some would look at local immigration issues, some might look at issues of ethnicity and community. Uh, we are an international migration research centre and our work does uh, span the international, the regional and the local. So from that perspective we are somewhat distinct from other groups in Canada especially. Um, Canada also has had for several years now the group called the Metropolis Group which has really focused on uh, issues of immigration in Canada with some international focus as well but we are fairly explicit in our interest in the international. Mm -hmm. Now people who study migration you mentioned come from different fields so geography, sociology, what other disciplines tend to uh, host people who have an interest in migration as an issue? Certainly economists, um, demographers, as well as uh, sociologists, as I mentioned. There is increasingly an interest in this issue in places such as social work because of the practice dimensions of working with newcomer immigrant populations. Planners are increasingly looking at this issue in terms of multiculturalism and the planning process. Um, political scientists look at this issue because, especially around issues of refugees and asylum, um, voting patterns. So really it's a theme that does cross most disciplines and there are, uh, in, again, increasing interest from educationalists as well. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about migration, that's actually a large category that covers a range of different kinds of things, mm -hmm. isn't that right? Mm -hmm. so what, what kinds of migrants are there and what sorts of groups of migrants are you particularly interested in studying? Okay, so if we use just the term migration, we can be thinking about internal migrants, and so depending on how governments structure their data collection, an internal migrant can be someone who moves from one address to another address. Well, usually we like to look at uh, migrants as crossing some kind of jurisdictional boundary. So that might be moving from one town to another town or from one province to another province. So those would be considered internal migrants. Our interest is in international migration. So those tend to be individuals who cross an international boundary. There's also the time dimension, so they can be temporary migrants, so 
individuals who move for just a short period of time. They could be seasonal or circular migrants, so they may be individuals who spend the summer, for example, working in one particular employment sector and then would return home uh, for the season, the off season. So those are circular seasonal migrants. Um, they could be temporary migrants, so they may be temporary laborers. You could have international students, for example, be considered temporary migrants. You have internal exchanges with multinational corporations. So those individuals are considered international migrants, even though they may be just for a contractual period of time. Then you have permanent migrants. Um, and then you have, of course, the example of individuals who are deemed to be seasonal or temporary, who in reality are, are permanent and long term. And so increasingly one of the interesting areas has been to untangle um, those issues and recognize the fact that, that in many cases we have a certain category we apply to individuals, but it doesn't adequately reflect the reality of their experience. Mm -hmm. And in terms of raw numbers, the, the number of people who cross international boundaries and qualify as one of these categories of migrants every year, it's been increasing, is that right? And it's also, we're talking tens of millions of people, typically. We are. We're talking um, a significant number, and it has been increasing. So we're looking at around 3% of the global population. And again, that would combine um, a vast array of different types of migrants. But certainly crossing international boundaries, it's now been seen as we're looking at unprecedented numbers um, and increasingly complex circuits of migration. We have uh, many individuals who are, for example, twice migrants or thrice migrants. So you have individuals who use step migration who may, for example, leave um, India and work for a period of time in the Gulf and then decide to move from the Gulf to North America to Canada, to Australia, to the UK, and continue on moving. And so we are also seeing not just an increase in numbers, but an increase in the complexity of mm. migrant circuits. So it's a complicated subject. We'll come back and talk more about the governance dimensions with uh, Mal Margaret Walton Roberts. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, Margaret, I imagine that every state, at least in theory, has detailed sets of rules about who can cross their borders into their country and why and under what circumstances and what conditions and what they have to do in order to establish themselves legally in their countries. I, I suspect that certain failed states may have the, the rules but actually can't enforce them. But to a first approximation, uh, states are the political units, the organizations that actually govern migration. Is that a fair thing to say? Um, generally, yes. There are some interesting variations right. and amendments to that, but generally, yes. Such as the European Union? Such as the European Union and the Schengen, Schengen Agreement. Um, also in Canada, we have uh, an interesting move towards, in some ways, um, decentralizing control for immigration processing. So Quebec, since the 1970s, has had an accord with the Canadian federal government where they have a little more autonomy and control over selection of immigrants. The federal government still does do all of the security checks and the processing, but Quebec has had some autonomy in that area. And since the early 2000s, many other provinces now have an agreement in place where they have what's called provincial nominee programs. So the provinces are having some degree of autonomy in selecting immigrants they are still processed through the federal government, but uh, Canada is an interesting example mm. of some of those shifts in the governance, if you like, of, of national immigration policies. Mm, that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, to what extent are states actually constrained or subject to regional or international norms, principles, laws? To what extent do states must sort of obey a kind of a governance arrangement that might not necessarily be of their own creation or of their own liking? The, the two areas where that is most apparent would be on the, uh, the United um, Nations Convention on Refugees. And so signatories to the UN Convention on the Rights of, and Protection of Refugees are held accountable to that document, so signatories to that document do abide by those regulations. Not all states are signatories, but a good number are. Um, so for example, you might 
find cases such as India. India is not a signatory to the UN Convention on Refugees, and yet they do host a large number of refugees, so you do have those examples. Um, but signatories to that convention are held accountable to those international requirements. Um, there's a great deal of debate with regards to how countries maintain their responsibility to meet the requirements of that. Um, and we have some interesting affiliates with our centre who do work on that topic. There's also the issue of um, human smuggling, and that's another area where we're seeing increasing international agreement um, to abide by certain regulations or to have certain norms and in practices. So that's another area. Um, beyond that, we tend to see less uh, international agreement on the topic of migration and it is as you said a t an area where states do feel they can exercise their sovereignty mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> in a period of time when we are seeing all kinds of agreements being signed for example in trade in financial agreement and other forms of governance um, migration is being held on to as a site for the sovereign state to exercise its sovereignty right now apart from the European Union which has the Schengen Agreement allowing more or less unfettered internal migration within EU bounds, or at least the signatories of the Schengen Agreement. Uh, are there other parts of the world where there are regional arrangements that might be stricter than the international arrangements provided for in the UN Convention on Refugees or on international agreements on human smuggling? We, we certainly see that uh, in Canada, the Canada-US relationship, where we have the Safe Third Country Agreement. So this is an agreement between Canada and the USA where um, refugee as asylum seekers who come across the land border are required to return to what's deemed the Safe Third Country. So if, for example, you had a Mexican or Guatemalan asylum seeker come to the border, um, the US-Canada border, Canada would be able to uh, send them back to the US to have their, uh, their claim processed there. So certainly we have that safe third country agreement in position here in North America. There are other areas where similar um, open border policies exist. So for example, example, India and Nepal have a agreement where labor is allowed to move freely across the India-Nepal border and people can work in either country. So apart from refugees and human smuggling, are there any other issues that are subject to a uh, fairly robust international agreement? Anything such as family reunification or guest workers or anything mm. of that kind? There is the International Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers and Their Families. Um, it is a convention that came in <coughs> to practice just within the last few years. But it has, a very f it has the fewest number of international signatories. So it's very hard to enforce it. Um, <coughs> it's mostly uh, receive sending countries that have signed that agreement. And, and the purpose of sending countries promoting that agreement is to protect their own people in other countries? Exactly, yes. So countries such as the Philippines, such as India, they have an interest, obviously, in protecting the rights of migrant workers. Um, and yet when you have a, a convention that is very difficult to get receiving countries to sign, for example, Canada is not a signatory to that convention, hmm. it's really ineffective as a form of international regulation. So if a recipient country has signed, then there are mutual obligations that actually do result in <coughs> increased protections for yes. migrant workers elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, is it particular countries that are especially concerned about this? We read stories, for example, about uh, Filipina housekeepers in the Gulf states, yes. for example, being frequently victimized yes. by their employers. Is mm -hmm. Specific countries have particular concerns. Yes, <clears throat> they do. And the Philippines has been one of the more activist countries in demanding rights for migrant workers. So, for example, recently, they demanded from Saudi Arabia that their workers, for example, there are many women who work as domestic housekeepers and others, other such forms of employment, that their rights be protected. And when the Philippines made the demand of the Saudi Arabian government, the Saudi Arabian government was able to say, um, no, we won't necessarily meet those requirements. And uh, in such cases, then a country can threaten to say, well, we will not permit migrants to come to your country. And uh, at that case in, in point, Saudi Arabia turned around and said, well, we can find people from other places. Mm. Are there any countries that have sort of model 
domestic regimes for migrant workers? Um, the, there are some examples where you have agreements, for example, again, using Canada as an example, this, um, there is a provincial memorandum of understanding between the prairie provinces such as Manitoba and Saskatchewan directly with countries such as the Philippines. In particular, there is an agreement in terms of nurses coming from the Philippines and working in the Manitoba and Saskatchewan health systems. Those agreements have been deemed by the Philippines as best practices. And so there are some examples where, again, Canada is in a very strong position in terms of the kinds of agreements they have formulated. For example, in the case of the um, Manitoba and Saskatchewan agreements, there are direct payments made to the Philippines to compensate for the transfer of these skilled nurses. Um, there are other areas, for example, we have a number of bilateral agreements with countries such as Mexico um, and Jamaica for agricultural workers. And again, we have uh, the Associate Director of the Centre, Jenna Hennebury, does a lot of work on that topic. And there it's more debatable. Uh, and so far as the nature of the visas are held to certain specific workplaces, and that is actually deemed by the UN to be problematic because it's a form of, um, it's a form of bondage in, in effect because you have no rights to move beyond that particular employer. So your rights are highly constrained and limited. Mm. So certainly Canada is an example where we have some cases that are deemed to be best practices. There are other cases where especially civil society groups have complained about the nature of employment and yet it, the sending country may not necessarily uh, be the one to highlight concern. For example, if we look at the temporary agricultural workers, there is a case currently where um, the union, the United Food and Agricultural Workers, has actually um, placed a, a, a lawsuit against members of the Mexican consulate in Vancouver for blacklisting workers who were active in unionizing their work colleagues. So you can see um, the variability. It's not a simple clear-cut case of the receiving countries uh, exercising greater power over the sending countries. There are some arguments made that sending countries themselves are very uh, careful to maintain a form of workforce that is more um, obedient and more compliant because they have a great interest in maintaining the flow of labour and the agreements and the remittances and all of the development accompaniments to migrant workers. Mm, fascinating. Well, we'll be back to continue our conversation with uh, Margaret Walton Roberts in just a moment. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Margaret, let's talk a little bit about your own research. Mm -hmm. So you said uh, you're a human geographer as opposed to a physical geographer. So I think people are probably familiar with both of those concepts. Mm -hmm. So what sort of questions do you tend to ask in your own research and how is it that you bring a geographer's perspective <coughs> to answer them? Um, my own research has focused very heavily on India and looking at the relationships between India and Canada in terms of migration flows and circuits and transnational networks. So I have, um, my research has examined the nature of relationships that, are ex that exist between India and Canada and how they are, um, how migrant flows uh, structure those relationships. So for example, I've looked at trade relationships, how trade and immigration intersect. I've looked at social and cultural networks, for example, looking at marriage, transnational marriage circuits. Um, and currently my research is looking at the issue of skilled migrants from India, but with a particular focus on shifts in terms of gender. Hmm. So I'm interested in understanding how female migration as an independent migrant as opposed to what was the norm for quite for, for a long period of time, uh, which was coming as a dependent, as a wife, a spouse, as a sponsored parent or grandparent. So I'm interested in that shift, which in some ways can reflect the rise of the legitimacy of female migration in the sending region. So and these are largely the, skilled people. That, for my particular research, I'm focusing on that at the moment. Because India has not 
necessarily been identified as a sending region for female migrants. So unlike the Philippines or Indonesia, where we do see a large number of women, for example, working as housemaids and domestics in places like the Gulf in Canada, North America and elsewhere, India has not tended to be as active in that area. But what we are seeing now is as India moves up the value chain in many ways in terms of the kind of migrant they're producing, you know, they have a substantial demographic dividend they can reap now because they have a large young population. So looking at training young people and having them seek overseas employment is certainly going to advantage the Indian government when we think about the impact of remittances mm -hmm. that people send back. So I'm interested in that shift and I'm looking at the rise of um, nursing as one example. Mm. And is this something that the Indian government and the Canadian government more or less stand back from and allow to happen for whatever reason? Or is there a certain amount of pull on the part of the Canadian government? We actively want skilled people from various countries and we go and solicit their immigration mm -hmm. or a certain amount of push from the Indian government that we, they actively encourage people to look for opportunities overseas. Yeah, both states are active in the construction of these flows. Um, the degree to which the state is the motive force behind it is an interesting one and something that I'm looking at. If we take Canada, for example, we have recently seen a significant rise in temporary migration of skilled and low-skilled workers. And the Canadian government would argue that this is not a policy that they have necessarily pushed. It's a policy response because they are being required to react to the needs of employers, especially in Western Canada. Um, in terms of health care, we have the issue of the basic demographic issues of Canada. We have a, a, an older population. We have a number of people who will be retiring from the healthcare sector. We have, in a, some would argue, our own mismanagement of long-term training of individuals for that sector. So certainly the state plays a role. The degree to which they are the ones pushing it is something that states will have their own position on. Um, in the case of India, when we actually look at the nursing sector in more detail, what we see is the government in effect having to respond to demand, especially from the private sector, because nursing is seen as an opportunity for international migration and in terms of social mobility and finding better economic uh, rewards. International migration is something many people are keen to pursue and people want to find an occupation where they will be paid well and where they'll have rights. And certainly healthcare nursing is an area that is identified as such. And so a number of private colleges had been trying to um, get into that area of training. And so the pressure was on the um, state governments in India as well as the central government to make it more flexible, for example, to open up the number of courses that are available, to increase the number of nurses who could be produced in order to facilitate the migration of trained nurses from mm. India. And countries tend to have reputations as recipient countries of migration patterns. How is Canada's? If the rest of the world were to look at Canada, would they consider us uh, a model country in terms of our policies, our, our treatment of migrants? Uh, is it a mixed, mess, mixed story? Are we considered problematic in certain key areas? I think Canada is seen as one of the positive examples in many areas. At a period of time when we have seen a great deal of sort of xenophobism rise, um, a kind of anti-multiculturalism position being developed in Europe especially, Canada does not seem to exhibit those forms of xenophobia to the same degree. So it's not to say that we don't have, that, that Canada doesn't have its own cases where we find issues of discrimination and racism. But on the whole, it seemed to be less severe than the situations that have emerged in Europe, for example. Um, the USA has a very different kind of issue in terms of undocumented migrants. They have a great deal of political um, inability to deal with these issues, and they um, create a number of, of tragedies really when you think about 12 million people mm. or so considered to be in the USA who have lived there for a number of years who don't have any rights. I mean that is a that is an intolerable situation to be in uh, for all kinds of reasons and so certainly the political stalemate 
in the USA is not something that we witness here in Canada. In Canada, I would say most political parties have an immigration agenda. They have different approaches to how they would deal with the portfolio, but we don't tend to have an extreme kind of wing which would want to dismantle the whole apparatus. Possibly because of our remoteness, our geographical isolation. I and mean, there's only one significant land border to cross to get into Canada. And the other side of that border is not populated by people clamoring to get into Canada. Um, possibly, but then I think if you look at Australia, you could make the same case about their mm. remoteness, yeah, and yet true. they have a very different approach to how they deal with uh, refugee and asylum seekers, for right. example. They have a somewhat different nature of immigration policy. I mean, that's not to say that Canada has not looked to Australia to actually um, emulate some of the policies that they have. So th the idea of remoteness is a difficult one to sustain now, especially when you think about the communications right. revolution, the fact that you can, within 24 hours, get anywhere in the world. Right, no, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. We'll be back one more time with Margaret Walton Roberts. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So perhaps we could finish up by chatting a bit about where we go from here in terms of global governance, and in particular, what issues do you see um, coming down the road? What sort of large issues need addressing? Who should be addressing them? Who's trying to address them? Mm -hmm. There are a number of concerns, obviously. We've already discussed the increasing importance of migra international migration. Uh, it has been identified as an important impetus for development. So obviously sending countries tend to be uh, less developed than the receiving countries. That uh, is typically the norm. And migration, international migration, provides a significant amount of remittances. So if you look at countries around the world where they have a large number of international migrants that they send, that are sent, that go overseas, remittances have become an important part of sustaining their economies. And so that is something that has been examined. Uh, the United Nations has taken the issue on in terms of the Global Migration for Development Forum. The um, UN has become involved in that uh, organization as well. And so this is really a collaboration uh, that has come together to examine the issues and to encourage debate and to exchange information and best practices. So it's not a group that is um, necessarily going to introduce any forms of regulation, but it's really an information sharing um, platform that can hopefully generate some good ideas that might be useful for enhancing the development impact of migration. So that is certainly an important issue that has been developing uh, recently. There is, of course, the focus right now on the global recession and understanding what kind of impact that will have in terms of migrant circuits and flows, and especially when we think of the significance of migrant remittances, what kind of impact will this have on the development trajectory of a number of states. So that's something researchers are looking at now. Although evidence from South Asia suggests that the, the global economic crisis did not have a, a very severe impact on remittances, that people still managed to maintain significant amount of money um, back home. Um, coming down the road, I think some of the more structural issues are going to be focusing our attention. We have climate change. There's a big debate now as to what degree of migrant, uh, what degree of migrants will be produced by climate change. How do we deal with environmentally displaced individuals in a situation where most of, with our only international agreement on convention refugees is one that specifically looks at political, mm -hmm. politically produced right. refugees. So how is that going to be managed? That is something I think that a lot of people are focusing on now and, and will be debating over the coming years. Mm. And who are the key players here? So the United Nations obviously is the place where a lot of the big agreements mm -hmm. are struck. Uh, what about civil society actors? Is that a, a large uh, sector? Are they increasingly getting active on these issues themselves and what kinds of roles do they play? Are they advocacy groups within countries mm -hmm. or are they transnational advocacy groups? We have, in terms of civil society, we are witnessing an increase in the activism, if you like, of communities. 
And how, as far as a, a sort of transnational civil society groups, there are colla collaborations between different groups. Many will begin obviously within the state because the state is the location where you can address some of the worst policy issues um, that are deemed to be problematic. There are also through, there are also international organizations such as the International Organization for Migration, the International Labor Organization. They also have a role in recommending certain kinds of policies, but there are, they, they sometimes are problematically positioned because they can also effectively be contracted by states to manage migration flows and in that management of migration flows they may also be uh, restricting the rights of migrants. I think for civil society we have seen a rise of interest uh, in terms of no one is illegal. Those kinds of groups exist uh, both within national situations and increasingly transnationally articulated to move certain kinds of arguments forward. And I think some of the most powerful though tend to be locally created and constructed. So if we think about the location of, ref of refugee camps, uh, if we think of Australia, for example, at a period of time when they were effectively locating refugee asylum seekers in the outback of Australia, which in many ways resisted their ability to access the legal rights and representations, you saw local groups in Australia begin to advocate on behalf of those individuals. So many times some of the most effective advocates do develop locally because they recognize how the rights of certain groups are being uh, restricted and curtailed. But the, the advocacy is directed in the first instance usually to national governments. And the reactions we see and read about in the newspapers, the sort of xenophobic, anti-immigrant sentiments that we see flare up occasionally, particularly in Europe for some reason, sometimes Australia. Is this in your mind uh, an equal counterbalancing force or just sort of the, the lingering remnants of an old style thinking about um, rights of communities to p police their own borders and determine their own populations? I, I think it's very difficult to generalize. Um, for example, if we look at the rise of anti-immigration discourse in Switzerland, Switzerland has a very interesting model of um, of refugee determination because the cantons actually make the decision as to who is granted asylum. Right. So it makes the issue highly localized and by taking it out of the role of national decision making bodies there is the potential for it to become highly politicized at the at the local level. So it does vary depending upon which country we're looking at. Um, so I, I I couldn't necessarily say across Europe one particular system, one particular process is mm. driving what's happening. I think there are political interest groups that during periods of economic decline will effectively scapegoat the other. Mm. And so that's certainly something that we have to be concerned about. And so it's a classic example of a multi-level governance problem. Thank you so much for coming in and spending time uh, talking with us today about migration. I certainly learned a lot and uh, I look forward to chatting further with uh, you and your colleagues and having them join us also later in the series. And to the audience, I look forward to seeing you again uh, next week on another episode of Inside the Issues. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.